Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I, there's a lot of rain in the background. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And as always, thank you very much to Miriam for organizing and staying on, staying, keeping me on task and uh, organizing questions. So, so thank you very, very much. Um, there's a real uh, cross section of questions here. My guess is that when we start bringing up things, it'll spark other ideas and that please, please feel free to share if you have an, a, another additional thought. Um, but basically what we do for those who aren't familiar is if questions crop up in your mind as we're going, you just put it in the chat. And then once we get through everything, then I go down the chat questions. And if you're not comfortable with the chat, just wait until the end and we'll give the opportunity for people to uh actually say questions with their mouths uh, as well. Before we even get started, I, I just want to clarify, because I think this is a point of a certain amount of uh, confusion. Broadly speaking, there are three types of fast days in halacha. Broadly speaking, Yom Kippur, we appreciate that Yom Kippur is a very holy day. Of course, that's so. But it's more than that. It's even more than being a holy day. It's the only Torah-mandated fast day in the entire year. So the halachos of Yom Kippur are a whole different ballgame than any other fast day on the calendar. One category. Tisha B'Av is interesting because Tisha B'Av is a rabbinic fast day. It is not a pasuk in the Torah that tells me to fast on Tisha B'Av. The rabbis instituted Tisha B'Av. But clearly, clearly, if you look at the halachos of Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'Av is really an entity to itself in terms of the severity of the day. So I think it'll become clear in different comments that we make that Tisha B'Av is treated more strictly than the other rabbinic fast days. But at the end of the day, Tisha B'Av is still a rabbinic fast. And since Tisha B'Av is a rabbinic fast, there are certain leniencies that exist for Tisha B'Av that do not exist for Yom Kippur. And then there's all the other fast days. All the other fast days during the year are A, rabbinic, and B, not of this unique severity that Tisha B'Av has. So I just want to clarify that right at the beginning, because you'll you'll hear at different times, we'll make distinctions. That's that's where it's coming from. We're going to begin by talking about um, halachos of fast days, and then at the end, we'll get into some three weeks, nine days uh, questions. Okay, the first question that we're going to begin with is so important. What's the story with taking pills on fast days, taking medications on fast days? And if one does take medication, what's the story with taking them with water or food? Okay, so let's let's go real, real slow. Okay, let's start because I, I just don't want to be misunderstood. We're going to start with Yom Kippur and then we're going to go like down from Yom Kippur. Okay, so two things about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. On the one hand, it's a Torah prohibition to eat on Yom Kippur. That's a big deal. And theoretically speaking, one may only one may only consume things on Yom Kippur if one's life is in danger. Okay, now there are, of course, medications that people take or situations in which someone needs to eat or drink that, heaven forbid, their life could be in danger if they, if they don't eat or drink. That's for sure. But there's a whole lot of medications that we take that aren't necessarily going to put our lives in danger if we don't take them, but might make us sick. So there's a very interesting nuance when it comes to Yom Kippur. And, and, and that is that Yom Kippur, the Torah prohibition of, of consume, consumption on Yom Kippur is derech achila, the normal way that a person eats. But if a person consume something in an abnormal manner, it's only rabbinically prohibited on Yom Kippur. So if I have a pill and I swallow a pill, or let me say it differently, if 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 I decide that I want to swallow something, if I want to swallow some burst of who knows what, is that okay on Yom Kippur? Well, normally not. Normally it's rabbinically prohibited, but the rabbis waive their prohibition if not taking the medication will make a person sick. So it's clear that if a person, if a person forgoes a medication, it could risk their life. Obviously one takes that on Yom Kippur. That's clear. 
But what's even further out is there could be certain medications that thank God a person's not going to die from not taking that medication, but a person might be in a different place for a week afterwards if they don't take that medication. Or heaven forbid, it's possible a person will have to go to the hospital if they don't take that medication. Those medications, as long as one consumes them in an abnormal manner, like a pill that one swallows, are acceptable to take on Yom Kippur. Okay? Now, where exactly do you draw the line on that? that that's where guys like me earn their keep a little bit the week before Yom Kippur. You know, uh, questions about what medications to take, what medications to pass on. Those are really best uh, addressed to a rabbi. And by the way, in many, many times, it makes sense before you call the rabbi to call your doctor. And, and you know, so the conversation with the rabbi is a more educated conversation. Is it important? How, how important is it? Okay. Now, if we're talking about regular fast days, rabbinic fast days, then it's it's a similar thing. Um, if there's a if there's a medication that if a person doesn't take the medication, it's going to make them sick. If there's a medication that if a person forgoes that medication, it's going to make them sick on the rabbinic fast day. Uh, then again, not not feeling well in the moment, but really sick then of course they should take the medication. And actually on a rabbinic fast day, we would say in whatever form it is, it's it's a liquid, it's a pill, they, they should take it either way. But the big question is, what about taking it with water? What about taking it with food? And my point now is not to answer every scenario. My point is to just educate everybody a little bit more about how things work. And, and then maybe... If people have specific shilas for themselves, come Shivasa Batamos, Tishabav Yom Kippur, you sort of will understand a little bit better where where the, the discussion is going and where it's coming from. So um, there's various opinions about taking water with medication. Let's go to the most extreme on Yom Kippur, taking water with medication on Yom Kippur. Rebbein Ritzachon of Racha was pretty lenient about it. Rebbein felt that taking a minimal amount of water to get the pill down is considered an extension of the medication. So if one has decided that a given medication is permissible to take on Yom Kippur, he, he would say, if it's no big deal to just swallow it dry, that's great. But many, many times with pills, we really can't really just swallow it dry. If a person needs a little bit of water to get it down, one could be lenient about that. So that's what I tell people um, as well. And if it's going to be true for Yom Kippur, certainly it'll be true uh, for Tisha B'Av and the other fast days. Now, what's a more complicated question is, yeah, it says that you need to take a full glass of water with this medication. Or it says that you're not supposed to take this medication on an empty stomach. And that's a situation where it really is case by case. It really, really is case by case. I'll say as an aside, my point is not to tell people to disregard the uh, the uh, um you know the medication's instructions. I do not mean that people should disregard it, but what I will tell you is when those shilas come up, certainly for Yom Kippur and sometimes for Tisha B'Av as well, I take down the name of the medication, I take down the dosage, and I call a, a doctor who I frequently consult for things. And there are so many times where he'll tell me, oh, that medication you're not supposed to take on an empty stomach when you've only been taking it for a month. But once you're taking it for more than a month, it's not a big deal to take it on an empty stomach. Now, there are many medications that it doesn't matter if you could be taking for 10 years that it's a big deal to take on an empty stomach. And that's really a real shyla. Certainly on a day like Yom Kippur, that's really a real shyla. Um, even on the other fast days, it, it could be in certain circumstances that a person is exempt from fasting because they need to take that medication. If they don't take that medication, they're going to become sick. And if they take that medication without taking food, it could be that the guidance for the person for that medication for the duration of time they've been taking the medication is they're going to become sick from taking the medication without food. So for the rabbinic fast days, there could definitely be room for leniency. And maybe even when a person has to be on a certain medication, they might even be exempted from fasting because they need that medication. But my my point, I guess the general rules I would say is certainly if a person's uh, very Life could be at stake. Of course, the person needs to do whatever they need to do. Uh, but for most of the medications, it's more that a person will end up being sick. A person will have a significant setback if they don't take a medication. Um, if it's in pill form, we generally say they should take that medication with a little bit of water if needed. 
Um, if one isn't sure where their medication falls in, that's a good shyla to ask. And if it says on the medication that you need to take it with a lot of water or food, that's definitely a good um, a good and important shyla to ask. So that's that's what I would give as general guidance um, for pills and 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 water and and food. I will say as a general rule that there are various medications. For example, that we take there are certain medications that we take once or twice a day. Um, certainly for a fast day like Shavas or Batamos, but even for a fast day like Tisha or Yom Kippur, many times we can stagger our dosages, and so we don't have to we don't have to even have the question about the medications on a fast day. So that's good to 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 keep in mind uh, a little bit as well. Um, okay, next next question. Are you allowed to use mouthwash on a fast day? That's a, that's an interesting question. Uh, and it's a question that is not only good for oneself, it's good for others as well. Um, regarding um, mouthwash on a, on a fast day. So this is an example where Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av are generally treated in one vein and the other fast days are treated in the other vein. It could be that if a person brushes their teeth, or takes mouthwash, it could be they could accidentally swallow something. For Yom Kippur, and even for Tisha B'Av, we're really very strict about that. So really the practice is, the standard practice, is to forego toothbrushing and mouthwash on Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av. It could be that if a person is going to be beyond themselves, it could be it's a little bit of a shyla, but if a person's not going to be, you know, totally distraught, the standard practice is not to do brushing teeth or mouthwash on Tisha B'Av or Yom Kippur, but the standard practice is to take, uh, is to brush teeth or take mouthwash on the other fast days, but a person is supposed to be very careful, more careful than they normally would be to not swallow anything. That's the story in terms of that. Um, there's a question about Listerine packs. So Listerine packs, it sort of dissolves in the mouth um, I would recommend against those on any fast day. In other words, you, what we said about uh, not brushing teeth and and, and and not taking mouthwash is to be very, very careful not to swallow anything. I, you know, it's sort of a little bit dissolves. It's sort of within the mouth. Uh, I, I I would say uh, I would I would stay away from Listerine packs uh, on on any fast day. Okay. Next question: How does it work with davening on a fast day? Um, so I, I don't want to uh, belabor the point too much, but just to give people uh, uh, a general sense. So basically, davening on the fast day is regular, except for two things. One is we say anenu, which is a special insert for a fast day, in an mincha of a fast day. Okay, if a person is no longer fasting, a person does not say anenu. Um, I want to I want to talk about this a little bit. We'll get into this a little bit later, but you know, if the halacha is that a person shouldn't be fasting on a given day, which many many times the halacha is a person shouldn't be fasting, it's really nice to say mincha with anenu. If you're not supposed to be fasting because you're not well, I would not try to be the hero to wait until mincha to say anenu. You, you know what I mean? You know, if if you only started feeling not so well and you could wait another five minutes at Davin Mincha, okay, I hear you. But if it's if it's 1030 in the morning and and you actually weren't feeling well coming into uh, uh, Shavasa Batamos, uh, to tell a person that they should wait to say a Nenu and Mincha, I wouldn't agree with that. But the bottom line is if a person isn't fasting, they don't say a Nenu at Mincha. If a person is fasting, they do say a Nenu at Mincha. We only say a Nenu at Mincha. We don't say a Nenu at Shacharis or the Marv at the beginning of the fast. The Chazan says a Nenu at Shacharis in the, in the Chazan's repetition. And there are Slichos on the morning of the fast day. Interestingly, we don't say Slichos on Tishba and Yom Kippur. Um, there are all kinds of halachos as to how to do slichos if one is davening privately. I, I don't think I want to get that far into the weeds here. But uh, those are the differences in davening on, uh, on fast days. Okay. Listening to music on a fast day, that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, just to clarify, I don't think the question is about 
Shavasar Batamus and Tishabov, because of course Shavasar Batamus and Tishabov is during the three weeks, and in general, we restrict listening to music. So the real question is Asar Bateves. Asar Bateves, is there an issue in uh, Tom Gedalia? Is there an issue in not listening to music on those days? So it actually is brought down to Halacha that it's appropriate to forego listening to music on, uh, on, a, on the fast days. Uh, would I go so far to say it's halachically prohibited? Don't think I would go that far, but it is appropriate uh, to forego listening to music uh, on all the fast days. Um, you know, the, the the fast day. I should I should just note this for a moment. Um, the idea of communal fast days in general is Yom Kippur is a different story, but in general, the idea of a communal fast day is it's a day that Klal Israel had terrible tragedies and since cloud israel had those terrible tragedies it's a day that we reflect and we say to ourselves we know that when tragedies happen on a national scale it's that something was going wrong for cloud israel and it was on such a great scale that the rabbis teach us that that's why such calamities befell cloud israel the process of a base of mikdash being destroyed the process of of losing uh, the regent that we had in Yerushalayim, all these different fast days. I don't want to go through the details of each day. Um, and it's a day to reflect and to, and, to, and to remind ourselves that our personal conduct makes a great difference in what's happening for the Jewish people, what's happening for us personally, and see how bad things became that, for example, the temple was destroyed. And I should be thinking about that. I should be thinking about how I could be better in my life. So if we're thinking about that, whether plugging into national tragedy, whether reflecting on, on, on trying to be better as a person, you know, to, to turn on the iPod to some uppity tune just doesn't seem to fit, you know, so that, that's, the, that's the general outlook. So we try to stay away from music on fast days. This next question um, is an interesting one. Uh, if people have to eat on a fast day, how and where should they do it? Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. So let's talk a little bit. So now let's get back to it. Depends what kind of fast day we're talking about. Yom Kippur. If a person is told to eat or drink on Yom Kippur, then what's being said is that if if they didn't eat or drink on Yom Kippur, it could be that heaven forbid their life could be in danger. Does that mean that they would have forbid drop dead on Yom Kippur? Not necessarily, but it means that it would create such a significant setback that perhaps they're somewhat frail in the first place. Perhaps they have a very serious condition that if they don't eat or drink on Yom Kippur, who knows what will happen to the person? Uh, that obviously is something to be decided based on consultation with a rabbi and a doctor. And if at all possible for the rabbi and the doctor to actually speak to each other. Um, it's a very important thing, um, which as an aside means that it's probably worth it to be touching base with the rabbi before Erev Yom Kippur. And, and, uh, and again, it's just, it's just an important thing to think about. Now, I want to clarify that there are many, many, many times where halacha will indicate that a person should take shiurim on Yom Kippur. Shiurim means to take very small measures on Yom Kippur. Um, the person who should be taking very small measures on Yom Kippur is the person who has received halacha guidance that they need to eat or drink on Yom Kippur. And this is the ideal way to do it. And if a person is going to take shiurim, they need to get guidance from their rabbi and their rabbi should be getting guidance from a doctor as to how they should be doing shiurim. I don't want to take too much time now on that, but it's very important to understand People make a mistake. People feel like, well, if I'm having a rough time fasting and I could use a burst, I'll do shiurim for a little bit. That's not what shiurim is for. Shiurim is for a person who halachically should be eating or drinking, and this is the best way for them to be doing it. And there are times where the appropriate halachic advice is they should not be doing shiurim. They should just be eating or drinking. And as, as one of the doctors in the community has told me many times, in certain situations, the medical term is to chug. That's not really a medical term, but that's what this doctor has told me many times. They need to just keep on drinking water, keep on drinking water. So that's a Yom Kippur discussion. Tisha is a very different story than Yom Kippur, but as we mentioned before, 
Tisha B'Av is a more serious fast day than the other rabbinic fast days. So if a person is going to be unwell on Tisha B'Av, it could very well be that they shouldn't be fasting. It could, be, and, and that's a discussion to have with the rabbi. But it's not just, will they, uh, you know, it's not just, will they, uh, will heaven forbid, will they, are they risking their life? We're not talking about that. That's not where the bar is for Tisha B'Av. The bar for Tisha B'Av is, will they, will their general health go into a tailspin? Will they end up being bedridden for a day or two after Tisha B'Av? Sometimes it might even be, will they end up being really bedridden that night or, that's already to discuss with the local rabbi. Okay. But the bar for Tisha B'Av is very different than the bar for Yom Kippur. An interesting question. Does someone do shiurim on Tisha B'Av? In other words, if the halachic decision is that it's not appropriate for the person to be fasting throughout Tisha B'Av. So would you say to a person, okay, so just don't fast. Or would you say to a person who should be doing shiurim? For that, you have different opinions. I, I, I normally I normally tell people that they should do shiurim in that case at Tisha B'Av. But if it's going to be very difficult for a person, there's there's certainly what to rely on to not do shiurim or just eat or drink normally. If a person thought it was relevant for them, that would be a, a, a specific discussion between uh, rabbi and possibly doctor and uh, an individual. Okay. Now for other fast days, uh, people should always feel free to call uh, if, if they're not sure how to look at it for themselves. For other fast days, first of all, I should clarify, a, a woman who's pregnant or nursing, the generally accepted halacha is that they don't even try to fast on all these other fast days, except for Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. Just a good thing to know. Pregnant or nursing women, they just don't fast. Forget it. That's that. <sighs> Advice for pregnant or nursing woman on Tishbav or Yom Kippur, that really should be a conversation, a specific conversation with the rabbi. Um, for the other fast days, if a person, sometimes I'll get a call that a person has been sick for the last three days, uh, they're getting over some kind of virus. Those people, I tell them, if you get up in the morning and, and you're not feeling well, and you feel just when you get up in the morning that you really should be staying in bed, you shouldn't be fasting on one of these days, on one of the regular fast days. Um, alternatively, if a person has gotten to the point that they're really not feeling well, and the barometer I normally give people is they have to lie down because they're not feeling well, not because they're tired or wiped out, because they're really not feeling well. Normally, when I get a call like that, I tell a person they should break their fast. And for any fast day other than Tisha B'Av or Yom Kippur, if we say a person should break their fast, we're definitely not talking about shirim. Definitely, definitely. We're just talking about eating and drinking normally. Um, so that's the story with that. If a person, uh, by the way, just to connect it to something we were talking about before, um, let's say a person has a very bad headache on Tisha B'Av, uh, not Tisha B'Av, let's say a person has a very bad headache on Shavas or Batamus. So it could be if they really have a bad headache and they feel like they need to lie down because they, they're not feeling well, it could be that they should, you know, just break their fast already. But if not, if they would like to take some some aspirin or something, it might make sense if it's something that they swallow, especially if they could take it without getting any without any water. Even if they need a little bit of water to get it down, it's a rabbinic fast day. They probably really have status as a holder right now. I'm not talking about a little headache. I'm talking about person can't function. They're just totally wiped out. It could be that it makes sense for them to take some aspirin with a little bit of water if they need it. But if that's not going to be a game changer for the person. Or it's going to take two hours to be a game changer for the person. Such a person, if it's a regular fast day, I would say they should just break their fast. Um, where where should they do it? Um, they should find the family member that's irritated them most recently. And no, that was a joke. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we're used to the idea of uh, people in various situations, are up to fasting. I'm not worried about Maris Ayan. On Yom Kippur, uh, it would, you know, obviously certain unique situations are different, but there are various people that my advice to them is they should be drinking with shiurim over the course of Yom Kippur. Um, it's probably not the most normal thing to do it in the middle of shul unless the person's really weak, whatever it is. And, you know, people find quiet corners somewhere in the, in, in, in the building 
that's another thing I do as a rabbi. We, we help strategize what quiet quarters are available within the building. Um, and I'm beginning to learn quiet quarters at other shows as well. But, um, but, uh, the, but the bottom line is, that makes sense uh, for Yom Kippur. But on regular fast days, I, 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 think there's a, I think we all know enough people. By the way, there are people who really, really don't fast well and are sick after their fast or become really sick on their fast year in, year out. Every fast day, they become sick. Maybe it's worth discussing with the rabbi, but those people probably shouldn't be fasting on the regular fast days. Those people probably should just be fasting on Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. And for some of those people, maybe not even Tisha B'Av or maybe Shurim and Tisha B'Av. But if every fast day is a, is a crisis, you can, you, talk, you can talk to a rabbi about it, but probably shouldn't be fasting on the regular fast days. Okay. Um, this was a really neat question. Um, a person, thank God, is fasting just fine. They uh, they go to Shul uh, Shavasa Batama's afternoon. It's a hot day. They come into their they come home, and what's the first natural thing a person does when you come home on a hot day from Shul? Grab a cup of water. So they make a bracha, and then it dawns on them that um, oh, it's a fast day. And uh, they haven't drunk anything yet. So what are they supposed to do? It's a really interesting question. So you have two choices, theoretically speaking. You can not make it a brach in vain and uh, drink a little bit so as that it wasn't a brach in vain. Or you could protect the fast and not drink, but you made a bracha in vain. There's different opinions. It's very interesting. The core of the halachic discussion is how bad of a sin it is to say to say God's name in vain. So if it's like a Torah sin to say God's name in vain, and it's a rabbinic fast day, it probably makes sense to just have a sip, right? You can make a bracha just even on a sip. Probably makes sense to just have a sip and then go back to fasting. If, if it, the whole thing is a rabbinic prohibition in the first place to say God's name in vain in the context of this bracha, maybe you're better off holding off. It seems the, 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 the greatest consensus is in that situation, a person should, um, it seems the greatest consensus in that situation is a person should um, just take a little sip, um, you know, and, and not, uh, not go on. I will say that if I get 25 calls to Shavasar Batamus about people who accidentally made brachos and didn't know what to do afterwards, I'm going to become suspicious that it wasn't such an accident. But uh, by the way, as an aside, nobody asked this one, but it's a separate question. Let's change the scenario. Let's say you, uh, let's say you made a shahakol, you, for, you forgot that it was a fast day, and you did drink a little bit of water. Now what happens? So what's one thing is clear is a person should keep on fasting. In other words, the fact that they accidentally broke their fast doesn't mean, well, there's no purpose anymore. A person should keep on fasting. There is a question on Allah if a person should do a makeup fast or not. Uh, that I would leave to a person-by-person basis that I think is a is a one-on-one discussion. It depends on various circumstances. So we'll hold off on that. But the basic Allah I want to share is if a person mistakenly eats or drinks on a fast day, they should keep on fasting. Um, okay. Um, may a person buy a new car or an appliance on a fast day? What about wearing new clothing on a fast day? So I want to answer on a few different levels. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Ideally, and again, we, we don't necessarily have control about everything. Ideally, a fast day should be a different day for us. In other words, ideally, a fast day shouldn't be a regular Thursday that we just didn't have breakfast, lunch, and it's going to be a late dinner. Ideally, it should be a day that's a little bit more reflection, a little bit more thought about who I am and 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 things like thinking about the base of Mikdash. Um, by the way, forgive the forgive the shameless plug. Um, we have a scholar residence coming this Shabbos, and uh Two of the three talks are Israel-related themes uh, and Beis HaMikdash and Zionism-related themes. So if a person is looking for something to be, 
maybe reflect on a little bit more. Come Shavas Abatamos, come the three weeks, come Tisha B'Av. Uh, God willing, we'll have these options over Shabbos. So just to keep in mind. But it, it shouldn't be a regular day to whatever extent possible. Now, the vast majority of us aren't holding by taking off of work for Shavas Abatamos. I'm not saying I would recommend taking off of work for Shavas Abatamos. But but to whatever extent it's possible, in whatever space, in whatever, if 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 we have a lunch break, we're not going to do much eating then, I suppose. So, you know, to listen to a to a ten minute cheer about something relevant to the fast day, it's very appropriate. Um, so it's probably not the ideal day to be doing, you know, optional purchases and things like that. I don't mean that it's prohibited to be doing those purchases. But it just doesn't seem to really fit. Now, a person has been desperately looking for a car and doesn't have a car right now, and a car just became available to them. And if they buy it on on Asar Bateves, they'll have a car tomorrow. And if they don't buy it on Asar Bateves, they're going to have to figure out another way to get to work tomorrow. It makes sense to go buy the car on Asar Bateves, and it's certainly allegedly permissible. But you know, if it's just you know, let's go, uh, you know, let's go shopping for whatever. Not the ideal day, but again, if a person needs to, a person needs to. Um, you know, if it's an exciting thing to wear this new garment, it probably doesn't make so much sense on a fast day. If a person needs to get a new garment, that this is what's available. And okay, so it's 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 certainly not prohibited. There is an interesting discussion in halacha regarding the status of Shavas or Batamus. Now, let me explain what I mean. I think we all appreciate that unless it was a, a, a very unique situation, a person shouldn't be buying a new car on Tisha B'av, right? Unless it was an extremely unique situation because we restrict special purchases for the entire nine days period. Certainly Tisha B'av, right? Uh, it does not make sense to be wearing a new outfit on Tisha B'av, right? We're, we're, we're like recycling clothes over the nine days, certainly on Tisha B'av. So Shivasa Bratamos is the beginning of the three-week period. What's Shivas or Batamu's status in terms of three-week restrictions? In terms of three-week restrictions, it's the beginning of the three weeks. So, of course, we have the three weeks restrictions. I should just mention, I wouldn't say this is an absolute halacha, but there is an idea, there are opinions that we try to observe the nine-day restrictions on Shivas or Batamu's. In other words, that's the beginning of the three-week period. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't mean it to extremes, but things like special purchases and and wearing new clothes and things like that, there'd be a greater reason to be particular about it on Shavas or Batamus than let's say on Asar Batavis. I hope that made sense. Okay, moving on to three weeks questions. May one do home renovations during the three weeks? This is an extremely common question, an important question. So here's the story. Home renovations are okay during the three weeks, not okay during the nine days. Now, obviously, the nine days is part of the three weeks period. But what I mean is from Shavas or Batamos until Rosh Chodesh Av, the beginning of the nine days, it's okay to do home renovations. Home renovations are generally speaking not supposed to be done from Rosh Chodesh Av through midday of the day following Tisha B'av. Okay, now two very important exceptions to that. One is there are times that a person's home is not functional and there are parts of the home that one isn't able to use and needs them or there's damage being incurred on the home if one doesn't get it fixed. There's this leak in the roof and and a number of rooms are not usable or damage is happening in the house, whatever it is. If the roofer could come during the nine days, it's fine. But the paint job should not be done during the nine days. And the, 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 the beginning of the makeup of the new kitchen should not be done during the nine days. That's, but if it's something basic, a person's bathroom, a, a shower is not working and a, and a person, they need another shower in the house. You could do that during the nine days. Um, and then the second exception, which unfortunately is an extremely common question, it was supposed to be done before the nine days, but it wasn't done before the nine days. So in that situation, the basic halacha is that if the contractor wants to work during the nine days, the basic halacha is 
that if he doesn't mind not coming during the nine days and coming back after Tisha B'Av, he's not going to charge you anymore. That's the preferred way to do it. If he tells you, are you kidding? If you tell me to come back after Tisha B'Av, I'm going to charge you more, then it's definitely okay to have them do it during the nine days. It's def- Again, not that the plan was for it to be during the nine days. It was supposed to be done before the nine days, but things didn't work out as well. But I'll tell you, to be very candid, what I normally tell people when they ask, I pose the following basic question, which is, if you tell your contractor to come back in a week, do you think it's likely that he's going to get lost and not come back for two to three months? And practically every person who I've ever asked that question to gives me a very nervous nod of the head. Yes, I don't know where my contractor is going to go or where he's going to come back. So if a person's concerned about that, I think it's reasonable to let the work continue during the nine days. But I repeat, that's only if the job was supposed to be done before Rosh Chodesh Av and it's just taking longer. But if the job is supposed to go into the nine days to begin with, then unless it's fixing something like a basic need in the house, then wait until after Tisha B'Av to start the job. That, that, that's the normal way to look at it. If a person's worried about losses and this and that, then, then that's a question. What's the story with the Shech Yonu during the three weeks? Um, so I want to explain what we mean by that. What we mean by that is one of two things. Either we mean... Um, buying something that's a uniquely special purchase that's going to be an exciting thing to have, that it's such an exciting thing to have that we will make a Shech Yonu on it. Um, you know, a person uh, person gets a, gets a new dining room set, a brand new dining room set. You know, for a lot of people, that would be a big deal. Um, a very special garment. I, I normally tell people like a gown or something like that, like a very special garment. Uh, most men I talk to, I don't think uh, I don't think the average man would make a Shekhi Yanu on a suit at this point. If it's a big deal for you to make a Shekhi Yanu, but um, or the other scenario is something totally different. Uh, a, a, a fruit that's only available in certain seasons and it's the first time in the season that you're eating it. So the general language in Allah is it's preferred, not usr by the way, but preferred to avoid a Shekhi Yanu during the three weeks. That's that's the general that's the general guidance in halacha, but not prohibited. Um, now during the nine days, we really we really curtail purchases that are not day to day purchases to begin with. Yeah, so I don't see a problem going to buy a suit during the three weeks, but during the nine days, it wouldn't be appropriate to go buy a suit. Um, but what I guess what I'm saying is, if if a person whether it be for financial reasons, whether it be that the timing, there's some, there's a wedding going on and, and there's a very special dress that a person wants to buy. If they wait until they have to dish up, then it might, might not be time. It would certainly be fine during the three weeks. And there are situations where maybe extreme situations, one could ask a child about the nine days, but I but, um, hope I answered that question. Okay, flying during the nine days. That's a really interesting question. So, the halacha says that things that are dangerous, one is supposed to forego them during the entire three-week period, by the way. Things that are dangerous. Again, obviously, if it's something that like only a mashugana would do, you shouldn't do it any day of the year. But things that that seem to be okay, but but are we, we appreciate they're a little dangerous. It's better to avoid it during the three weeks. And people are even more careful about that during the nine days. What does that mean for us practically? So I'll tell you one thing it definitely means, elective surgery. Elective surgery, that's not, you're not under the gun for the surgery. It, it, it could happen anytime in the next three months. It's probably better to not schedule during the three weeks because I think we appreciate that every surgery carries with it. We should all be well, but every surgery carries with it a certain degree of danger. I can't emphasize enough that there are various surgeries that are being scheduled for a person's well-being and the doctor will say it should happen sooner rather than later. In those kind of surgeries, if the doctor is concerned that it's not a good idea to push it off until after Tisha B'Av, then by all means, a person absolutely should get the surgery done, three weeks, nine days, whatever, whatever. I, I can't emphasize that enough. It's very important to keep that in mind. 
uh, and I don't have to tell all of you, I'm sure that many, many times, even if the surgery can wait a couple of weeks, and that's, oh, a couple of weeks isn't a big deal. When you call the scheduling people, they say, oh, sure, we'll, we'll put you in sometime in the next six months. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, so if there's real medical concern, it doesn't have to be pikuach nefesh, but real medical concern about pushing it off, you should do it during the three weeks. But if it's something that it's really, you know, just have to do it at one point or another, it's better not to do it during three weeks. It would make sense not to do it during the three weeks. Um, you know, there could be certain, uh, it probably makes sense to not go bungee jumping during the three weeks. Uh, with all due respect to all the bungee jumpers out there, um, um, probably makes sense. Um, traveling, where does traveling fall in? I mean, Hashem should uh, watch over all of us, but I think all of us consider travel and flights, you know, pretty common in day-to-day -day activities. Um, I, I don't tell people not to travel during the three weeks. I don't tell people that. And, and if a person is nervous about traveling during the nine days, some people will tell me they don't do it. They don't want to do international flights during the nine days. Okay, I hear you. Uh, you're not crazy if you feel that way. Um, but if that's the time that it, uh, that it makes sense to travel, I, I, I think it's okay. I, I, I think our, our situation is, is Bli uh, Ayin Hara. Travel does not seem to be this great risk. Bli Ayin Hara. We should, we, should all, we should all be well. Um, I hope I answered that. Halachos of traveling on Tisha B'Av itself. There are many times where this question comes up. A person has a business trip they have to take on Tisha B'Av. A person, uh, there could be all kinds of things. So if at all possible, travel on Tisha B'Av should take place in the afternoon of Tisha B'Av and not in the morning of Tisha B'Av. Um, uh, really, Tisha B'Av, the focus really, really, really is supposed to be on the morning of the day, far more than whatever we said about any other fast days. So if at all possible, uh, the, the, uh, if a person does need to travel, it should really be that they're traveling in the afternoon. If they can't, they can't. What can I tell you? I, I, I can't say it's absolutely yes, sir, but if at all possible, it should be that the travel is happening in the afternoon. Um, I, I, I think that's the story with that. Um, uh, it's a very technical question. Uh, the laning on uh, communal fast days, there are certain psukim that the congregation responds and like the balkore pauses, the congregation responds. And then, you know, like the congregation says those psukim and then the balkore says those psukim. So the question is, what about the guy getting the aliyah? Where does he fall in? So I think the standard thing is the balkore is like the representative of the fellow getting the aliyah. So uh, he should say it along with the balkore. In other words, he should be quiet when the congregation is saying it. And I believe he says it along with the balkore to the best of my understanding. Okay. Uh, thank you to all the people who submitted questions, and thank you to Miriam for organizing all those questions. Um, okay, we're going to get started on the chat now. Um, there is an idea. It's interesting. The question is, what about not going to court during the three weeks? Um, there is an idea of avoiding court during the month of Av. It's not as much a three-week thing. Um, Av is considered not a good month for the Jews. Uh, in general, and and certainly, let's say during the nine days, if a person is scheduled uh, to go to court, and by the way, if it's Jew against Jew, it doesn't really make sense to be worried about. It's not a good month for the Jews because it's all Jews. But if it's a Jew against a non-Jew, and there's a way to to push it off until at least after Tishbev, it makes sense. But if this is when the court case is, this is when the court case is. But it's more about the month of Av than the three weeks. Thank you for raising that. Yeah, thank you for your comment, Menasha. I don't even get that one, but I'm going to... Um, oh, interesting question. On a hot, regular fast day, should one stay home and miss show to keep the fast? Does this change on Tisha B'Av? So, uh, you know, first of all, by the way, if, we're, if a person's driving, I'm not sure how much being outside for a few minutes is going to impact their ability to fast. But everybody's different, and maybe a person, for whatever reason, doesn't have access to a car. It could be for all kinds of reasons. Um, I would say it's more important to fast than to be in shul. Um, if it's like Yom Kippur, of course, we're very strict about fasting. If a person, a person wants to be in shul on Tisha B'Av, 
if a person knows that if they leave their if they leave their home, they're not going to be able to fast, then they should stay home. But if a person's like, I don't know, maybe I'll get very weak if I leave the house. Maybe I won't. Then I would encourage a person experience Tishbav, go to Shul, you know, say Kinos, you know, get 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 connected. I, I don't think that's being reckless. I hope I answered that question. Interesting question. What about showering and laundering on fast days? Of course, we're not talking about Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av, we don't do those things. Uh, but what about other fast days? So uh, there'd be a question about Shavas or Batamos, again, because there are opinions that say one should keep the restrictions of the nine days. But again, not, not an absolute prohibition. Um, the basic halacha on all the other fast days is it's permissible to shower, to launder, and things like that. There are those who are strict about it. Um, uh, but by the way, laundering would definitely be okay on all the other fast days other than Tisha B'Av and Shavasa B'Tamos. Definitely, definitely. Showering, there are those who will be strict about it. So I want to repeat. Tisha B'Av, of course not. Shavasa B'Tamos, there would be a real idea of not showering or laundering. Not an absolute prohibition, but a real idea. In the other fast days, it's definitely, definitely mutter to launder and mutter permissible to shower, but there'd be an idea of being stringent if someone wanted to be stringent. I hope I answered that. Um, really interesting question. What's the story with the night of the 17th of Tammuz? the night leading into Shiva Tammuz. So we know that one is allowed to eat the night leading into Shiva Tammuz. We know the fast of Shiva Tammuz doesn't begin until the morning. But what about the three weeks restrictions? Could someone listen to music the night going into Shiva Tammuz? So the general encouragement on Lacha is to pass on it, but it seems that if push comes to shove, the three weeks really have not begun uh, until the fast begins, Shavasa Matama's morning. But I believe there are different opinions about it. But if a, a person certainly would have what to rely on to not keep the three week restrictions until Shavasa Matama's morning. Yeah, thank you. That was an interesting one. Um, makeup fast, I'd rather, I'd rather address on a person by person basis. I'm sorry, this uh, just, uh, it's a fair question, but I just think there's a lot of variables. I think I'm gonna, I think the only result of my talking about it will be confusion. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, I would share the uh, great frustration of getting a kosher meal on the plane but realizing it's a flashing kosher meal during the nine days. Thank you. I think making investments during the three weeks is perfectly fine. Perfectly, perfectly fine. Making charitable donations is even better. Sorry. But uh, but investments during the three weeks is perfectly fine. Probably not appropriate on Tisha B'Av just because we're supposed to be focused on other things. Oh, good question. Lawn service. Okay. Lawn service. I would... Okay. Lawn service during the three weeks... Um, Definitely fine. Definitely fine during the three weeks. Um, during the nine days, if it's no big deal to not have the lawn service during the nine days and your grass will look just fine, um, I, I would say it's it's better to hold off during the nine days. Having said that, the vast majority of us, it's not like we're actively interfacing with our companies. They just sort of show up whenever they show up. Uh, for regular mowing the lawn, I think it's, I don't think you have to tell them to stop during the nine days. I think it's fine. Um, if you're the one mowing your lawn and you're trying to decide, you know, should you do it during the three weeks or should you do it during the nine days? Better to do it during the three weeks than the nine days. But if you get to the nine days and your lawn is an absolute disaster, I don't think that's really beautification. I think that's more making your lawn look menschlich. So better to do it not during the nine days, but if your lawn's a disaster, it's okay during the nine days. But I don't think it's your responsibility to stop your 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 company from from doing it during uh, during the nine days. Real real landscaping, like like really like really getting a nice job done. Um, it's probably better to not have it done during the nine days. Do you have to make your company mashuga? I don't think you have to make your company mashuga, but. Uh, you know, if you have a say in when they come, it's probably better to not do it during nine days. And you as an individual certainly should not be doing it during the nine days. 
hope that was clear. Let's see what else. Okay. Standard practice is sewing and embroidery are normally we we normally sewing like like sewing an item embroidering an item we normally pass off on we normally pass on those during the nine days um it's like a button fell off or something i think that's fine um you know button fall off mending and a person needs the garment during the nine days i think it's fine if it's no big deal to hold off until after the nine days it's better to hold off um but like really creating something shouldn't be done during the nine days. It's fine to have a seamstress work on a dress or gown during the three weeks, but during the nine days, it's not appropriate to have a seamstress working on the dress or gown, even if they're not Jewish. I, I You don't have to sit there and like inspect them as to when they're doing it. You know, if you drop it off sometime during the three weeks and it's plausible they could get it done during the three weeks, it's not your problem. But it would not be appropriate to drop off the dress of of the nine days, you know, the day before. That wouldn't be appropriate. Um, okay, I believe we've gotten through all the chat questions. Any questions that people would like to call out? Okay, while we're waiting... I just, forgive me, and I don't mean to be rude to anyone else, but whenever I see Mr. and Mrs. Spiro, I have to say hello. So I saw them earlier at the thing. So hello, it's always nice to see you. Thank you for, very much for taking the time to join us. Um, I also, it it uh, it was public, it was already out there publicly in another year. So I want to take this opportunity. I think I saw Mrs. Ruchelman on before. So Kenai Nahara, I hope it's okay that I say this. Dr. Ruchelman, Dr. Leonard Ruchelman Kaniner is celebrating a 90th birthday tomorrow. So a happy birthday to him and many, many more years in good health. Um, any, any other questions or comments? <clears throat> um, just, I'm just curious for a moment. People can kind of just like kind of thumb up or thumb down or, or put a chat in. Somebody recommended for a topic coming up. I don't know if it'll be the next topic or not, but someone recommended for a topic coming up. Um, that um, halachos of like a person davening and shoal, that would be like things like if you came late, what you're supposed to do. Uh, if you daven a different nusach than the shoal davens, things like that. Does that sound interesting to people or, or not really? Any any quick? Uh, okay, getting some response. Okay, thank you. And as always, if anyone has any other ideas, please feel free to reach out. You can reach out to me, but as you all know, it's even odds that I won't even respond appropriately. So if you really want your thing to get attention, reach out to Miriam. Miriam relays all the things in a very thorough way. So if you have any ideas for other topics, you can feel free to contact me, but Miriam is your better bet. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And as always, uh, thank you very much to Miriam. And uh, have you. a wonderful night, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.